Our first speaker today is Ross Anderson. Ross is a professor of security engineering at Cambridge University, also the founder of the uh, Foundation for Information Policy Research and a prominent activist on issues of information security and privacy. Has a long history of campaigning on issues from ID cards to cryptography to intellectual property. And he's going to talk to us today about cryptography, security, privacy and freedom from 1912 to 2012. There's been a bit of a shift in perspective um, over a couple of generations. I mean, Alan Turing uh, and I were both Cambridge Maths graduates who ended up as computer science professors. Um, during um, his um, 30s, he was basically working um, at GCHQ to defend freedom, working for the government, breaking uh, Hitler's codes and ciphers. Since I joined the faculty of Cambridge University in my mid-30s, I found myself on most of the issues um, of the day on the other side from GCHQ. So what has happened has um, information security technology uh, turned from being a help for freedom into a hindrance, uh, or has the structure changed or what? Well, the closest I can find to an inflection point is around about 1970, because in 1969, James Ellis, working for GCHQ, discovered an early form of public key cryptography. And he, being someone of my dad's generation, essentially almost of Alan Turing's generation, um, obviously thought that the thing to do was to keep it classified, and in effect, the UK um, armed forces never used the invention. Five years later, when Whit Diffie and Martin Hellman, who were basically of my generation, independently discovered public key cryptography and digital signatures, the NSA tried to persuade them to keep quiet, but they would have none of it. They went straight um, to the Scientific American and um, the um, IEEE Proceedings in Information Theory and broadcast the invention. Both of them were, of course, trying to defend freedom. But in the meantime, the culture had changed, the swinging 60s, the Vietnam War. It was no longer assumed that governments were the people who did the defense of freedom. What about the technology? Well, during the 1980s, there's a whole number of people worked on making fancier versions of cryptography, digital cash, electronic elections, anonymous communications. And it's the anonymous communications which... Um, have basically stood the test of time. And the idea was that if everybody had their own computer, then by giving people appropriate software to run and letting them set up and exchange keys in appropriate ways, you could then set up rules for social behaviour, uh, for contractual behaviour, um, that could be enforced. For example, people who wanted privacy could encrypt email from end to end, and it would not be possible for a government snoop to intervene. So that was, if you like, the techno-utopian vision of the 1980s. You may have heard Larry Lessig on Coder's Law and various other resonances from that period. In the 1990s, um, the flotation of Netscape and the arrival of um, the Clipper chip and so on um, pushed policy debate um, to the centre. And in effect, what was happening is that government departments thought hey, there's this internet thing. I wonder if there's something in it for us. So the policemen wanted to police it, and the spies wanted to spy on it, and the uh, military wanted to do various things with it. And so we had a, a huge big tussle for control of cryptographic keys, for key management infrastructure, and so on, um, which went on until the RIP Act in 2000 in this country. During the 2000s, we have then seen a corporate grab as those companies that survived the dot-com boom and then the bust started grabbing more and more turf, more and more estate. This is where we find Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and so on, building empires online. Can cryptography help us now? Well, the answer is very often it can help an awful lot less than you think. And one of the key reasons is that we assumed in the old days that both endpoints would be under the control of the user. I would have my PC, you would have your PC, and I could sign a message to you or encrypt it or use various mechanisms so that when it arrived, you didn't know who it came from. But nowadays, it's generally the case that users don't control both endpoints because your email may be at Gmail, and Gmail, in effect, acts as the endpoint. And one of the big policy issues now is if the government knocks on Mr. Google's door, what are they going to get? So there's an emerging pattern 
in that during the crypto wars, people said, we need to have cryptography to defend our privacy. And the law enforcement people said, you better not have that because if criminals have uh, cryptography, that's the end of the world. We won't be able to surveil them anymore. But these arguments have turned out to be wrong, and we began to suss that in the mid-1990s. First, you can't fix privacy using cryptography because most privacy violations involve abuse of authorized access by insiders. Whether it's somebody presenting a warrant to Mr. Google, or whether it's Mr. Cameron last December announcing that all NHS records in England and Wales would, from September this year, that is from next month, be available for research to help British drugs industry to grow and grow and grow. And the second point is that cryptography isn't a huge threat to law enforcement since most of what law enforcement gets is from communications data. Now that means um, who called whom when, your itemized phone bill in effect. And there's very, very much more of this now that we're doing digital stuff online than there used to be just in the, the age of phones. You see, if you tap somebody's phone, then what you usually get is, Fred, see you at the usual place in 10 minutes, right? And if it's not one of the operations where you've got 20 people in five cars just lurking around the suspect's house, that information isn't much good to you. But if you can get the um, um, itemized phone bills of your suspects, and of all they, the people they called, and of all the people they called, then very quickly you can map the network and find out what's going on. <coughs> so these two themes that first emerged over 15 years ago are driving what are now today's two hot policy issues in London. And uh, despite devolution, you can't <coughs> escape at least the first of these. You can escape the second a bit. Uh, but the first of them, the communications bill, is not a devolved matter, so it will rain bad things north of the border too. The communications data bill basically gives the Secretary of State whatever powers she um, wants or says she feels she needs to harvest people's communications data. Now this is not any more just your itemized phone bill. This is um, where you go online. And the sort of places that you go online, the sort of people or groups that, we, that you interact with, can leak an awful lot of information. Uh, Gaydar, Narcotics Anonymous, there are lots and lots of sites, interest in which says something about you. And of course that's of interest to the police, and we had a big fight about it 12 years ago during the RIP, bills passage through Parliament. The police at that time um, wanted to define communications data as a whole URL that you entered. So if you went to Google and searched for uh, pregnancy termination advice, then the URL was www.google.com, um, query equals pregnancy and termination and advice, and the police would get all that stuff. So we managed to get through a, an amendment in the House of Lords, the Big Browser Amendment, to the effect that communications data would only be enough to define the machine that you were talking to. So it would be everything up to the first slash. Um, but Government is not content with what they got in the, in the RIP bill. And what they want now is to have the powers to compel um, phone companies and others to install black boxes, deep packet inspection equipment, which will um, record um, your online sessions and pull out from it any information that they um, deem to be communications data. In fact, they can do interception as well, as I'll mention later. Now, what this means in practical terms is, is that at present, BT's got five big data centers. These data centers um, each have got about 20 DPI boxes in them, which can um, wiretap about 1,000 um, subscriber circuits. And these are installed for um, lawful intercept purposes. That's about 1% um, of BT's home internet lines. So, um, what the Home Office is in effect saying is that they want to move from being able to wiretap 1% of the population uh, to 100% of the population. And what they propose to do is to keep, they say, for six months, um, records of all the uh, people or digital objects with which you have interacted. Um, this, I think, should be one of the red lines because we have in the past had basically two philosophies of surveillance in the world. The first is a state that can watch everybody, 
such as we have at present. If um, MI5 thinks that you're a bad boy, then you will go in one of those 100,000 surveilled lines, boom, like that, and you will be watched. But as there's only 100,000 of them, they can't watch everybody. The second type of approach you have is a state that can watch everybody. That's what they try and do in places like Turkmenistan, that's what they were doing in Tunisia, that's what they're doing in Syria, Iran, often with equipment supplied from the UK, by the way. Um, and the people who sell this equipment would like a bigger, richer, and more convenient market here. What else? Well, the bill gives the government the power to order BT saying, thou shalt go and install 5,000 of these new Naris boxes from Boeing Incorporated at a cost of 700 million and kindly get Boeing to send the bill to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And then once the boxes are installed, they can be used for any lawful purpose. That means they can be used for wiretapping under existing legislation. The next big problem is that we, or to be more precisely, Erich Merkel, a journalist in Austria, dug out the fact there's an organization called ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, which does, as you say, it would, as, as, as it says on the tin, it works out standards for phone companies, and they have got a committee full of spooks and phone company people and suppliers, which works out the standards whereby, for example, the police wiretap your mobile phone um, um, operator. So they, they don't want to have to build 100 different systems for 100 different countries to look at mobile phones. So instead, they have a committee which sits down with um, Alcatel and Ericsson and the other big switch makers and say, this shall be the interface whereby the police slurp up your um, mobile phone location history. And they have decided to empire build into the space of web service providers. They point out that if the police are entitled uh, to hoover up your email from BT, then once BT subcontracts its mail service to Yahoo, as it has done, surely there must be an API, an Etsy-approved API in Yahoo, where the police can go and slurp out your data. Now, this is going to be an interesting fight. Why? a number of reasons, and one of them is jurisdiction. Suppose um, the president of France goes to London to watch his hockey team in the Olympics, and suppose that one of his aides opens his laptop in Heathrow to check his Gmail, and GCHQ says, aha, Mr. Google, we've seen the following laptop in London, kindly give us access to this person's Gmail. And you're Google, how much do you give? Do you give the three emails that were sent and received in Heathrow? Do you give the last 14 days emails, which may be very useful diplomatically for um, negotiations on Greek debt? Do you give a log on to the whole account? Do you give them the Google Docs and the Google Calendar as well? You see, it's really, really hard. And once you have compelled Mr. Google to build an interface so that MI5 can go in and read your Gmail, then how do you stop the French demanding access as well? And then the Italians. And then the Egyptians. It's a democracy after all, and Google's got staff there. They can't very well turn around and say, sorry, um, you guys have got too deep a suntan. We're not giving you the API. That's racism. You can't do that. So where do you stop? Right? And this is going to be an absolutely fascinating um, debate to watch. The next big problem is what happens if you give automated access. Because you see, at present, if you go to Google and you produce a warrant and say, please give me this man's Gmail, it's subject to manual review. And if there's any doubt at all, it's reviewed by lawyers. What GCHQ and the Home Office want is automatic access. And the reason for that is that, so that they can do recursive searching. If I decide, for example, that Ian is a double plus on good person, then I want to go to all the, the companies which are on my system and say, um, Ian is a double plus on good person. Give us a list of everybody he's communicated with in the past six months, please. And then I want to feed all these names into a further query. Right, there'll be hundreds now, and then a further query, and there'll be tens of thousands now. And now I've got a list of millions of people who have communicated through two steps removed with Ian. This is called a snowball search. Right? And that, then I go through this list of people to see if I've got anybody in my terrorism list or my organized crime list or whatever. This is how the agencies want to operate. The problem is that in order to operate that way, 
you cannot have the Google lawyer sitting there verifying every single access request to see if it's kosher or if the agencies are taking the MIG. And then there's another thing that may scupper it, which is competition and innovation. At present, G BT has got the most centralised network in Britain. Others, such as Virgin, are very much more diffuse, and the cost to them of putting in black boxes everywhere would be significantly greater. And then, if some of our research students decide that they want to do a startup, and the startup's going to offer some kind of communication service, if the law then says that they've got to have a wiretap facility, what's the implication for that? Can you imagine how difficult it is to design in a wiretap facility if you're producing some new kind of online game? You have to go to all the trouble of asking yourself whether when two people are together in a dungeon, is that a notifiable communications event? And then perhaps there'll be an Etsy subcommittee to which you have to refer your proposed API for approval. And of course, Etsy meets two times a year, so that's a six-month pipeline stall um, introduced into your cycle. Oh, and um, the security service is very, very um, insistent that people who handle communications intelligence product have a security clearance. They no longer insist on in interviewing you to make sure you, that you're heterosexual, but they do still insist that your father was born in Britain. Now, all of my research students are foreign, and half of them are enemy aliens, Right? Indians are Chinese. So how are they going to do a startup? Well, hey, the Home Office wouldn't give them a visa anyway these days, so maybe the question is moot. But you can begin to see, perhaps, that there are some problems here with mandating um, wiretapping. Another thing that affects me personally is that I've got a postdoc who is one of the maintainers of TAR. How many people know TAR? A good number. Good. So TAR is an anonymous communication system funded mostly by the U.S. State Department, designed originally by um, the U.S. Office of Naval Research, um, now kept going on an NGO, uh, not-for-profit not basis, largely so that people in India and China can surf the web as it actually is, rather than as the great firewall would like, like you uh, to believe that it is. The bill will give the Home Secretary the power to give me a secret notice saying that I've got to build in a back door. For example, make encrypted logs where we promise there aren't any logs and mail them off to GCHQ. And furthermore, I'm not allowed to tell anybody that I've got this notice or I get thrown in jail and the key thrown away. So what am I going to do about it? Well, what I'm planning to do is that if this bill comes through, um, I will swear an affidavit um, under penalty of perjury, and I will put it on my website saying that I have not, in the month um, of July 2012, been placed under any compulsion um, to um, put back doors in the software by the Home Secretary or anybody else. And every month, of course, we'll put up the new affidavit. And if the affidavit ever fails to appear, then everybody worldwide knows that whatever you do, don't trust any software written in Britain. Do not include any British code in any of your builds, in any of your open source projects. And finally, there are some um, deep political questions. The GCHQ used to be a non-controversial body because it busied itself with entirely worthy things like tapping Mr. Hitler's uh, telegraph lines or trying to tap Chairman Mao's telephone and uh, nobody but a few tinfoil hats ever objected to that kind of activity. But following 9-11, the NSA, its American um, counterpart, turned the antennas inwards and started a massive campaign of unlawful wiretapping of US uh, citizens. Now this actually matters um, because GCHQ is part of a, a network that is in effect run by the NSA and the NSA is so much larger than the rest that the, the other countries, Britain, um, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, get not just our equipment from the USA, but doctrine, training, and very much else besides. So there's a legitimate concern, firstly, about whether Britain is acquiring a domestic and electronic surveillance agency without a proper debate about that. Second, there's a question about whether we need a domestic electronic surveillance agency, um, given that our country is at peace, uh, we face no existential threats from foreign states and the crime rate is as low as it ever has been. 
Third, if it is decided that we do need some kind of domestic surveillance agency, what sort of agency should it be? Now, my view is that it should not be something like the NSA, it should be something like the FBI. So if we are going to have some kind of central facility um, for um, doing electronic stuff, forensic stuff in support of the police, then I would very much rather have it placed at the new National Crime Agency or at the Metropolitan Police or somewhere like that, rather than um, becoming the natural path of evolution of an agency which always had a history of um, you know, operating under military rules. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the, um, the medical privacy thing because time's up and because it doesn't affect Scotland anyway, but it is also important, um, and if they get away with it in England, then the um, clinical practice research database or something like it will be coming here real soon now. But for now, the main thing to think about and worry about if you're in Scotland is the communications data bill. Thanks. <laughs>